Get ready to enter a brave new world with your host, Vasant Dar. Brave New World is supported by the Center for Data Science, or CDS, at NYU. If your organization is interested in engaging with CDS through student projects, please email cdsindustry at nyu.edu. For more color on the podcast and additional commentary, please subscribe to my newsletter at basantdar.substack.com. Hello, and welcome to Brave New World. My guest today is Missy Cummings, a former U.S. Air Force fighter pilot. Missy is now professor at the George Mason University College of Engineering and Computing. Her research is on the application of artificial intelligence in safety-critical systems, the human-machine interface, and the ethical and social impacts of technology. Missy, welcome to Brave New World. I am delighted to have you on the show. I am delighted to be here. So. You know, I'm always fascinated by names, and uh, you know, some of my colleagues sort of, you know, uh, get a chuckle out of that. But your name is especially fascinating. Like, did your parents name you Missy, or did that evolve from a nickname and became like the real thing? What, what's the story there? Yeah, so that's not actually my real name. Uh, it was one of my call signs when I was in the military, and it just kind of stuck. So was it like a, a term of endearment? You know, I, mean, I did some research into it. And... Oh, I don't think so. <laughs> so was it an admonishment? <laughs> like, what do you think you're up to, Missy? Uh... Exactly, exactly. I think um, if you can't believe everything you see in Top Gun, you don't give yourself a call sign. You always get deigned with a call sign, and it's never for anything good. Like, so for example... If your call sign is chunks, that means you threw up in the plane. So, you know, I mean, right. (laughs) So, Missy, all right, that was fine. It could be so much worse. Yeah, true. You know, I went to a boarding school myself where everyone had a nickname. You know, no one was spared. So I can identify with chunks and bunks and and all of that, you know. And and it goes on for generations, right? There was a guy called Fatty. That's right. There was a guy who was, you know, overweight. And, you know, I'm talking boarding school in the 70s. You didn't hold back, right? So he was called Fatty. And then there were subsequent generations who weren't fat, and there was a thin fatty and a medium fatty and all these things, right? So, yeah, so I I can (laughs) identify with nicknames. Well, Missy, I am delighted to have you on the show, and I just want to start by you telling us a little bit about yourself. You know, you mentioned military, but what's your sort of journey been like till this point, and how did you get interested in you know, safety issues in AI and and specifically in transportation, which is an area that I find like really fascinating. Yeah, you know, it was a very circuitous journey. Uh, I was in the military and I was a fighter pilot. And after in my last tour, uh, my op- last operational tour flying F-18s, I really saw the struggle between the pilot and the aircraft. And in those three years, on average, one person died a month, 36 people, and none of it was because of battle. It was always because of human-machine interaction. And so that really motivated me to go back to school. I got my PhD after I left the Navy. And then at that time, my PhD was in something called cognitive systems engineering, which is really how do we design systems to uh, consider the human. And then at that time, I was primarily focused on automation in aircraft and complex systems. But then it became clear that the big push was going to be into AI. And so I pivoted and I pivoted to not just human automation interaction, but human autonomy and AI interaction. And that led me to do a lot of work in aircraft and uh, vehicles of all types. Um, and then I was on the cutting edge wave of self-driving vehicles. And then, and people think it's a bit of a misnomer. So if there's no people in there, why do you care about self-driving vehicles? It turns out that the creation of AI is a uniquely human endeavor. And this is something that people don't really understand, that uh, all the 
AI that goes into a self-driving car and large language models is hugely biased by the way we create it. And so that's kind of where I am now is trying to capture AI safety elements that really are starting to be introduced in the systems at the design stage. Well, what are the main issues here in terms of safety and the risks involved? You know, and, or, you know, I mean, I guess at a higher level, someone like Elon Musk would argue that, look, at a societal level, this is a no brainer, right? You have 40,000 deaths every year from accidents, you know, 94% of them are human error. Clearly, humans make a lot of mistakes. And, uh, you know, I, I had a near-death experience myself in April. I'm literally, you know, living my second life where I feel that, uh, you know, where I wonder what the situation would have been if we were in autonomous vehicles as opposed to, you know, uh, human driving. So, right, so Musk would say, hey, in the aggregate, this is so much better. Mistakes will happen. This will get better. You know, what's missing in that line of reasoning or, or what's misleading about it? Like, Well, he might find this surprising, but on that point, he and I actually agree if we're just talking about the big picture. So we have lots of evidence in aviation that with the introduction of autopilot and with the introduction of auto land systems that, uh, you know, efficiencies have gone up in aviation and so has safety. You know, where aviation is an incredibly, especially commercial aviation is incredibly safe. And we have a lot of technology to thank for that. Indeed, um, the miracle on the Hudson, even though there's a huge human component to it, the way that the aircraft was designed also was a, a huge factor in the successful landing of that flight. So I'm not against uh, the use of technology. Indeed, you know, I, I won't go to a gas station if it involves uh, dealing with a human. I have to tell you, as the person who, who does this technology, like I'm all for AI and automation in the right place. However, what a lot of people don't know is that in the 1990s, when we were starting to put a lot of what I would call baby artificial intelligence into airplanes. I mean, you, in the nineties, you were taking your, some chances flying in a commercial Airbus and then later Boeing. Boeing was a little late to the party, but they've also had similar problems. So there have been a lot of problems with inserting automation, AI inappropriately into systems. And it did cause a lot of deaths in the nineties in aviation. We eventually got past that and we've converged on a much safer place. So I tell people in the year 2024, we're kind of in the 90s when in parallel with aviation automation, we're not sure what works and what doesn't work. And even more problematic is the fact that, you know, in a divisive not just nation, but we could argue the world, we tend to get people who want to gravitate to the poles of reasoning. And that's only further complicating what I would say is a fundamental science communication problem. Right now, automation, AI in cars in terms of lateral and longitudinal control is not safer than regular human driving. And the instant it is, you will hear me stand at the top of every bell tower on every university and say, we're here, we've arrived. But we haven't arrived yet. I'm not saying we never will, but we aren't there right now. So uh, say a little bit more about this. So what's not, you know, because this is sort of a fundamental question here, a question here, like who's better, right? Are humans better or are machines better? And I think what you're saying is it depends on what the task is that you're talking about, what specific thing it is, right? There's some things that humans are great at and other things not so good. So let, let, let's go a little bit deeper into that. What, 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 are you, um, what are you getting at in terms of like where machines are not as good? When you say lateral, say, say a little bit more. Is, did you mean like lane changes and things like that? 
Well, lateral and longitudinal control, lateral, yeah, lateral is you can think of lane changes, passing, whereas longitudinal mm -hmm. control is straight ahead, like uh, accelerating and braking. So in America, you can go to San Francisco, for example, and in Arizona and ride in a Waymo driverless car. In most cases, you're going to be fine. Uh, although even on an everyday basis, those cars are still having a huge problem with pickup and drop offs, meaning where's the safe place to pick somebody up and where's the safe place to drop somebody. This is a challenging perception problem, but it's also a challenging planning problem, especially in dynamic, heavy pedestrian intensive environments. And so what the pick off pick up and drop off problem is really, if I want to abstract away, what are the real issues? It's uncertainty management. And this is something that I've been talking about for a long time. AI works best in the sweet spot of its design domain. But when you get on, out on the edges uh, in when uncertainty is high, all AI, no matter where it is, including large language models, doesn't work very well. And so the idea is that you keep the system as close to the sweet spot as you can but unfortunately, the pickup and drop off problem, you've got to go to the bounds of uncertainty. And, you know, I know the companies are working on it. Um, I'm not saying that they won't get to a good enough solution. We can do some things in the infrastructure to help them. So, you know, and you've probably seen this even with Uber and Lyft. There are better places for them. They know ahead of time that are better pickup and drop off points. So if you'll go there, it will increase the safety of the whole system and guarantee you a smoother ride. So it's a small caveat. And I, I think that's one that we really should embrace. Look, if, if we will help these systems reduce the uncertainty, then we will get a better outcome. I think companies are sometimes loath to do that because then it's an admission that they can't do it. At least in their minds, it's some kind of uh, negative admission. Whereas in my mind, I'm like, look, we know they, they struggle in high uncertainty environments. So the more that we can do to set up a successful infrastructure will mean the systems are more likely to be successful. So what are these other examples of these high uncertainty environments? You know, other than, let's say, you know, where you pick up or you drop off, which I've seen in sort of an increase now when I take an Uber, it usually suggests a pickup. Uh, point M much more than it used to, right? So clearly they've um, learned something about this, right? That they want to reduce those risks as well. What are some of the other sort of high uncertainty situations? Any pedestrian um, intense, dense environment, you know, anywhere where you've got a lot of pedestrians, Bicyclists, we've seen um, Waymo's cruise vehicles all really struggle around lots of people, especially if they're bicyclists, cyclists, unicycles, you know, those, these are objects that just are underrepresented in their training sets. And plus their degrees of freedom of movement are so much higher. Like, you know, a human can pivot and go in a direction very quickly that's unexpected by the uh, machine learning algorithms. And so that can be difficult to plan for. The situation that um, resulted in Cruz losing its license to operate in the state of California was another good example, uh, a pedestrian jaywalking. It turns out that uh, Cruz didn't hit the pedestrian jaywalking. Another vehicle hit her and then knocked her into uh, the cruise vehicle's path. But it turned out that the cruise vehicle, and everyone can read this on the accident report that's been posted on the internet, the cruise vehicle actually detected her nine seconds. As soon as she stepped off the curb, it detected, correctly detected her and correctly was able to estimate that she was gonna get hit by the other car. And in the middle of doing that calculation, it accelerated into the into a bad situation, right? So even though it quote unquote knew she was about to get hit by another car, instead of stopping and honking, which is probably what a human would do, 
it accelerated into the situation. And then when she was hit and knocked to its path, then hitting her was almost impossible to avoid. Then it decided on its own to keep driving and move over to the side of the road where she got caught under the undercarriage of the car and she almost died. You know, she just recently got out of the hospital. So why did it accelerate? What was the... Lots of sources of uncertainty here. It was night. So computer vision cameras are hampered at night, just like your eyes are hampered from reduced lighting at night. Uh, it accelerated into a bad situation. So we, because it has what, it doesn't have what we call situation awareness. It, this is something that we don't know how to imbue into AI right now. Like a scene understanding that takes account all the, individual elements and can do a fast simulation in your head to do the what if simulation, right? Like, well, that's not a good idea. If she's, if there's a pedestrian jaywalking in the road and I can do a closest point of approach estimation and see she's going to get hit by this other vehicle, maybe I should stop. If nothing else, just stop. But of course, stop, honk, and alert everyone in the scene because it's clear. So, I mean, nine seconds is forever in the world of transportation to know that something bad is about to happen. And, you know, cars don't know anything. They don't have knowledge. They just have statistical projections. And it didn't, it, you know, it just was never programmed to have any of this kind of awareness. So I think that this, when I say this kind of awareness, like understanding nuanced relationships, we also know, for example, large language models cannot do that. So I think one of the things that's happened more globally is people want to believe, people who should know better actually, want to believe that somehow we've developed algorithms that can approximate general intelligence. And the simple sad fact is we are no closer today to general intelligence with algorithms than we were five years ago. And, but we think we are. And that's actually where the real danger lies. And why do we think we're there or close to being there? What, 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 what's, why are we fooling ourselves? So I call these people the believers. It's almost a religion. People want to believe in something that is in their minds could have been unobtainable. It's like a, it's like magical thinking. They just want to believe that we are either at general intelligence with computers or close to general intelligence. Because if we are, it means that we're transforming ourselves into a whole new world. And, you know, I, it's arrogance. It's the human condition. Like we want to believe that we're special. We want to believe that we're part of something bigger. Whereas, you know, if we zoom out, we're just one little tiny step forward to maybe one day achieving uh, artificial general intelligence. But that day is not going to be in my lifetime. And indeed, as an academic, one of the things that I worry about is the longer we go down the wrong path, and and I'm not the only person saying this, like, like all, all the big brains that are not believers, you know, we all say the same thing. Like, we're not there. We're, we are not any closer to general intelligence than we've ever been. And what happens is we waste we research money going down a path that is going to turn out to be a dead end, whereas we might have made more progress if we weren't so fooled by our own arrogance. I want to come back to this notion you talked about, situational awareness, uh, because you've, uh, you've written about this as well. And I, I, I guess if I were to express your position uh, sort of more abstractly, it's, it seems to be that this bottom-up approach to learning is great. It is biased, as you uh, referred to earlier. I'm, I'm going to come back to that issue, that, that any sort of data is uh, biased. But you seem to be saying that the situational awareness requires sort of some sort of top-down reasoning, which can involve common sense, experience, all that kind of stuff. And I, if I were to sort of summarize your position, I'd say that you're, you're saying that that's fundamentally not achievable at the moment 
by the pure sort of bottom-up approach. Yeah, Is I think that that's fair? very fair. I, I'm impressed that you're paying attention. Now, if I could only get my students to pay that close of attention. But yeah, I call this judgment under uncertainty and what true knowledge is. Knowledge is just not knowing a bunch of facts. That that That's declarative knowledge in some old definitions of psychology. But real knowledge is the ability to reason under uncertainty. And like we've already talked about, uncertainty is the death knell to artificial intelligence in the way that we're formulating it right now. And so it is just simply unobtainable to get to true knowledge and to what I call expert-based reasoning, which is the ability to reason under maximum uncertainty using tools and mathematical approaches that regress to the mean. And this is everything that, you know, if you know anything about a neural net, the most important thing to remember is neural nets learn the most common patterns, the most frequent patterns. They do not detect and indeed cannot detect new unknown events. That's just simply how they work. And this is why large language models, if they're given a concept that they've never before seen. They can't reason about it because they've never seen it. And we've seen this in self-driving cars where uh, there was a case recently in Arizona where a tow truck was towing a vehicle backwards. So uh, I think it was a, a tow truck towing a truck, but the truck was reversed in the towing for whatever reason. And on that day, it was hit by not one, but two Waymo cars, because if a computer vision neural net encounters an object in the world it has never seen before, it is invisible. And that is why it hit uh, two different Waymos, hit the same truck two different times in the same day, is because because it had never seen a reverse truck being towed, it is as if that object did not exist. And this is a huge problem. And, and I keep trying to express to people, you can only go so far with technology where something it has never seen before is invisible. We just simply cannot function in society, particularly in safety critical systems, if we have invisible object, invisible language, invisible, you know, whatever images. You just can't function that way. That's very interesting in that situational awareness isn't explicitly represented in the training data, and it's very difficult to construct it bottom-up from the data, which is why I'm really wary about trusting full-on autonomous highway driving, where I go to sleep and it wakes me up at my destination. There are just too many Rumsfeldian unknown unknowns and even though they rarely make mistakes, they occur in the blink of an eye and the consequences can be really disastrous. You know, whereas on the other hand, I trust my trading algorithm, which is almost, you know, which is wrong almost half the time. And so to me, trust has to do with the consequences of mistakes and whether we can do anything about them once they occur. In other words, how dire are the consequences of mistakes, even if they're rare? Yeah, you know, I... I... I hear you, and I think that some of your experiences, and indeed, the longer you work with this technology, the distrustful you are. I mean, it's just, it's just like the famous saying, you know, when you see how the sausage is made, you don't want any of that sausage. Uh, I, I think though, what's interesting to me about what you said is that you feel like these errors are rare, and so I find that different people have different definitions of what is rare, and so. We know that in the best circumstances in the laboratory, the best circumstances, computer vision algorithms that leverage AI, these are called convolutional neural nets, in the best of circumstances, they have a 97% accuracy rate. That sounds great. You're like, 97%? Well, that is good. Um, but that means that three out of every 100 images that this algorithm views, it gets three wrong. And this is where we start to 
need to rethink what we mean as risk and what is rare. So in a any given drive of a self-driving car, it is looking at, on the order of magnitude, tens of thousands of images in any single drive. So when you multiply 10, uh, tens of thousands by three, that's a lot of mistakes in any one drive. So, you know, uh, for any self-driving car doing, and, and, and we're, we haven't even started to begin to talk about Teslas, which I think are actually far more dangerous than self-driving cars, um, that a lot of mistakes are being made in every single drive. Now, Good engineers will design robust systems, wait, this is why we do data fusion, so that if a computer vision algorithm fails, that there are other ways to detect. But even those sensors are not perfect. Even LIDAR, which is a laser rangefinder, will not see all obstacles uh, in its path, particularly if there's any moisture in the air. So, you know, if we went from, let's say, 30,000 possible errors using computer vision, and let's say the computer vision algorithm resolves, uh, you know, the bulk of that. Uh, and you're still down to, let's say we've got 1,000 errors left and you've mitigated 29,000 errors. That's, that's, again, from an engineering perspective, that's impressive. But if you still have 1,000 errors going through the system on any given day, then what we're doing is we're relying on the system the larger system to help correct for those errors that people don't, other people will get out of the self-driving car's way, or, you know, there'll be some affordances made for whatever um, bad behaviors. So I think that we don't really, and this is why we can't say that these vehicles are safer than humans today because we are still gathering that data. We can take broad metrics. And even in, in the analysis I've done of the California data, it looks like at best the self-driving cars are on par. They're on their safest days. They are akin to an Uber or a Lyft driver. But on their dangerous days, you know, they're very dangerous. And by the way, these are under slow speeds, um, 45 miles an hour and less. I think we are all about to witness the true test of this technology, which is Waymo says it's going on the highway. And the problem with going on the highway is while you can control risk and mitigate it under slow speeds, if you're having a thousand mistakes for every drive at high speeds, you're just not, that's, you're not going to have that buffer that you had at slow speeds. And it's entirely possible that the car simply cannot do it at high speeds. The best data we have right now are from Tesla's. It doesn't look good. Um, although Tesla's are only partially capable, they don't have LIDARs and some don't even have radars. So it's hard to know what's going to happen, but I don't think it's going to be pretty. I, by the way, I heard that Waymo just crossed uh, 100,000 rides a week last week in the four cities, uh, I guess it's San Francisco, Phoenix, Austin, and I'm forgetting the last one. So, you know, it, at least in terms of urban driving, they seem to be doing all right, like no no real disasters. But let's talk about Tesla because you, you mentioned Tesla. So, so, so what about Tesla? Are they safer, less safe? I know that it's really hard to get their data out of their computer, you know, from, from whatever I've gathered, that they're very... Um, guarded about sharing data, and I suppose I can understand that to to some degree. Um, but what, what's what's the, uh, what's the story with Tesla? Are they less safe? Like what what is the what's the data telling you? Nobody knows for sure uh, because, as you mentioned, Tesla will not share their data, and when we say share their data, they won't let independent evaluators take a look at their miles traveled data and you need the miles traveled on autopilot versus not on autopilot. And then of course you have to look at the number of crashes. And so they cannot be believed until they let independent uh, evaluators take a look at the data. So who do they share uh, that? I mean, they must be required by law to share their data with NTSB or? 
you no. know, the NHTSA, right? Aren't, aren't they required no. by law to share that data? They, they are required to share accident data, but they are not required to share miles travel data because they are going to argue, and I do understand this, that Sure. That is proprietary. Yeah, yeah. what I meant was actually the accident data. That Yeah. yeah. So we can see the accidents, Mm -hmm. but we don't know what we call um, exposure. That's called exposure data. We just don't know um, how many miles are truly being driven on autopilot and full self-driving versus not. Um, But when I was in NHTSA, I did look at Tesla's accident data, and it was clear that if you are in an uh, accident in a Tesla, you're more likely to die or be severely injured. Uh, but that fact was driven primarily by the fact that you, in almost every accident, the Tesla drivers would set autopilot at nine miles over the speed limit and speed kills. There's That is absolutely, and this is one of the problems that Waymo is about to find out, that you can do a lot to mitigate bad technology, but at high speeds, you know, both the, you know, F equals MA, plus the fact that humans um, have more difficulty gaining control at high speeds, you know, it's not surprising that if you're, that what is happening is that Tesla drivers are more complacent, they're more confident, they're willing to use the technology, and they're willing to use it faster. And it's killing them. You know, one of the questions that always fascinates me, uh, uh, you know, a general question that applies to all kinds of problems is, are computers better, are humans better, or is the combination of humans and computers better, right? And... Very often I find that people want to believe in this last scenario, right? Uh, especially in finance. You know, people, oh, you know the, the combination of humans bring something to the table. Let's say, you know, situational awareness, top-down reasoning, they bring something to the table. I found that the combination isn't always better. Sometimes you're just better off leaving stuff to the machine. Is it possible to actually collect data on these three combinations objectively and come to an answer? That is, you actually observe purely humans, you observe pure autonomous, full full automation, and you have a combination, right? Where you actually don't have full automation, but you do have sort of up to, let's say, stage three, you know, where there's some sort of assistance and, uh, and the human is actually required to not, you know, let the vehicle go into sort of fully autonomous mode, right? So, you know, prior to our conversation this morning, I was just thinking about this. Like, why why would it be so... Well, firstly, is there any data on this? It seems to me that data like this would be incredibly valuable in helping us, you know, get sort of better insights into at least, you know, when the combination is better, why it's better, and maybe answer some questions about whether we're really ready for... Uh, autonomous vehicles now or whether we will ever be ready for that? So I, it's your question you just asked is basically summarizes my entire academic career. That has my, been my job for the last 20 years is to tell you when should you be mutually exclusive with humans and or automation and when should they be combined? So there are clear wins in the human plus automation AI Chess. It's been a, it's well studied over and over again that a human plus a computer or plus several computers can win at chess. As long as the, as as long as the human doesn't do much. Well, but the human is supervising, right? Yeah, I know. And we, I, I, and I would tell you, so, so we, that's been a big win in the military and actually in aviation, commercial aviation right now. Humans work with the planes who are doing the bulk of the flying, but we need, they are effectively a high pay babysitter to intervene when they need to, when there's a problem, but that's what we're paying them for, right? So we could say the entire commercial aviation and a large part of the military operates on human plus automation in the right scenarios. There are also some clear scenarios where automation is the outright winner. And that is control of nuclear reactors, for example. So when a nuclear reactor is starting to go critical, 
humans cannot actually get to the button and press it fast enough to insert the rods. And so in those cases, we absolutely need very reliable automation to do this. Now, are there any cases where artificial intelligence reigns supreme? This is more murky because it really depends on the kind of AI you're using. Most people are thinking of neural nets, but there's also what we call GoFi, good old fashioned AI. And for example, all the path planners that you have in your ways, uh, Google Maps, uh, Apple Maps, you know, we all use these path planners, but, and for the most part, they are going to be much faster and much compre, much more comprehensive. So for most of the time, the good old fashioned AI that's in all these path planning algorithms is always going to be better, except occasionally I was, I was in Baltimore yesterday when, for whatever reason, the map was wrong. So occasionally it's, we, we get it's wrong. There's been construction. So, and, and, and or traffic and or local knowledge that you have of when a route is not going to be better. And so, the combination of you plus the path planning algorithm is going to be better than you alone. So this is a good example that even, and we call this function allocation. The function allocation is not mutually exclusive and it's not stationary, meaning it's not going to stay the same as time, as the time horizon unfolds. Sometimes exclusive might be better and sometimes joint might be better. So you really have to understand the task at hand. I think one of the things that gets missed in the self-driving car community is the fact that the car itself, I'm all for self-driving vehicles. I actually think there's a lot to be said about self-driving um, shuttles because I think the economies of scale make much more sense. And last mile delivery, particularly for places that might not um, have the ability to get groceries from the places that they might want them. Uh but there's a huge AI collaboration piece, which is the remote operation centers that supervise the vehicles. This has gone completely unregulated. No one is paying attention. And indeed, it could have, st had we actually built a human plus AI architecture in the case of the pedestrian that got run over by the cruise vehicle, we could have avoided that accident. And so one of the things that I see is that we forget that AI exists inside of a system. It's not just one vehicle, for example, but it's a network of vehicles and the vehicles do terrible under uncertainty. So let's have humans coach them when they're experiencing situations that are high in uncertainty and they don't need coaching if it's low uncertainty. It makes perfect sense. You're like, oh yeah, that does sound good. Everybody thinks that sounds great until you actually talk to the companies and the companies are like, well, that costs money. And we don't want to spend that kind of money. So, you know, you mentioned something I was going to bring up a little later, but let's talk about it now since you brought it up, which is these remote centers. You know, I, I teach a class on tech innovation and I take them to the West Coast. And one of the places we visit is T-Mobile. They've got the right word, very impressive lab there. And, um, you know, one of the things they were demonstrating was sort of the latency involved you know, so for example, if you're operating a vehicle from a remote center, you know, anything more than 10 millisecond latency doesn't work, right? From the time you actually press the brake to the time the vehicle actually responds, it's got to be under 10 milliseconds for it to work right. I mean, to me, that sounds like really interesting, right? So what that would suggest is that if the latency were low, then it would argue in favor of these remote controlled autonomous vehicles, wouldn't it? Yeah, I'm thinking like, what are the lower risk situations and the high risk ones, right? And I think you started alluding to these already, right? That last mile delivery, uh, shuttles, right? These are sort of low risk kinds of situations, right? So when I look at the whole landscape of, of autonomous vehicles, right? The fully autonomous seems like very high risk. But to get there, um, do you see these sort of remote centers uh, being sort of emerging sort of on this path to full automation uh, if we get past the latency problem? Well, I just, you know, I love that you've been caught in the quicksand of teleoperation. Um, 
uh, this again is, you know, like squarely, this is like the dead center of my research area. So the latency issue is serious and insurmountable at this point. Um, I am, though, as a T-Mobile customer, thrilled to know that T-Mobile has some kind of cutting edge lab, uh, but T-Mobile cannot get anywhere close to the kinds of maximum delays that would be required. So for a, to safely operate a, and by operate, I mean, you're sitting in a video simulator game with a driving and you're actually driving a real car somewhere in the world. To, to safely do that, the latency one way Glass to glass has to be about ten milliseconds. Right, right. That, that's what I was saying. So, so if it's ten milliseconds or less, then this seems like a feasible. It could, but in practice, we have not seen. And, and that, remember, that's maximum. Right. In practice, they are hovering around a half a second, sometimes a second. So we're not seeing in the real world, anything close to what would actually be required. And so, you know, I good for T-Mobile that they're hopefully doing research, and I would like that to be true for all the companies. But we're just, I, I haven't seen anybody do sustained operation with maximum latencies that never exceed that. I just haven't seen it, and I don't know of anybody so you has. So you don't think this remote operation uh, approach is, is feasible or, or likely? So, I, you know, it's possible it's, and potentially safe, very slow speeds, five miles an hour or less. That's, that's the Missy Cummings view. Other people take a slightly different view. Um, so if you're like, for example, if you need to slowly back a car out in a remote center, I, I'm good with that. You have cameras, you have other things that you can do to augment your sensors. But the delay can cause serious problems. Now, can you drive a car at speed with anything more than that kind of latency? No. Tons of reports have shown over and over and over again it's unsafe. And we need to be regulating this in this country. Um, it, uh, globally, we need to regulate this because it's extremely dangerous. Uh, dry, teleoperating a car with the kind of latencies that we're seeing uh, in the communication sphere right now is just downright uh, unsafe and negligent. And, uh, I'll, you know, if, if people really do are allowed to operate this way, I'm going to put my daughter through college based on the expert <laughs> witness fees that will come from the deaths that will result. Sorry, I shouldn't, uh, I shouldn't laugh. But clearly you're not a believer in, in that uh, approach. Uh, okay. So, I mean, this is so funny to me when you say a believer. Like, it's physics. Like, if you want to say you have to believe in physics, but like, <laughs> I'm just here to tell you this, this isn't, this isn't something that there's a belief system unless you don't want to believe in physics. Now, you know, if you're Newtonian, you're going to say it's impossible at this time. I'm not saying that we couldn't achieve that. And because, you know, we've made tremendous progress in communication technologies over the last few years. I think that though the question, it really comes down to cost. What it would cost you under present day technology to keep the communication packets, you know, moving at the rate that they would need to move consistently to never exceed that 10 millisecond maximum latency. You know, in the end, it's like it, it's a cost benefit analysis. Who does that really benefit? What would be the cost to do it? And is that really sustainable for what would would be a, actually a relatively small set of uses as opposed to the fact that we're trying to improve the communication network for every person everywhere on the phone all time you know people in rural issues you know so i yeah. i think that you just have to be realistic about is it possible yeah it's possible with today's technologies it's just not sustainable so you know you talked about regulation, right? So what are regulators thinking at the moment in this space, in the whole AV space, and what should they be thinking? And actually, let me just preface that with something else. You you know you talked about the safety of commercial aviation, which actually happened way before AI, right? So that was a product of 
sort of regular technology, uh, systems thinking, regulation, right? So that has worked quite well for us in the commercial aviation space. So what is it that we're missing or that we need in terms of regulation in the AV space? What are you advising regulators? Well, it's interesting that you say that because, I mean, if you were one of those families that lost your loved ones on all those airplanes in the 1990s that crashed because of our poor understanding of human automation integration, you would probably disagree. And and I think that... Disagree with what? The commercial disagree, aviation? They would disagree that like that we're in a safe place or, you uh-huh. know what I'm saying? Like, right. so it, it's hard to remember because people, you just don't remember what it was like to be part of the flying public back then. You know, we, at that time, one of the things that happened was the FAA and all the other regulatory agencies had to figure out that we were, they were lagging where the technology had leaped ahead. And then, you know, and in, in fact, if, if I could give you a research graph, the research into the human automation interaction problem, it was basically non-existent before that. And then people started to realize that, you know, if you put too much automation in the wrong way and you don't, provide the right tools and training and interfaces that people will die. And so that sparked a a whole wave of researchers. I probably would not be here right now if it had not been for that huge wave of demand for research to fix a problem, right? So, you know, I mean, it is uh, Henry Petrosky who sadly recently died. I mean, he said to to air to engineer as human to mean you're you're we're going to make mistakes, we're going to kill people, but we're going to get better over time as a result. So, I think that when I talked about, you know, we're kind of in that same spot right now. The regulators are new to this game. Um, there's a lot of technology that's racing ahead. The regulators are always slow to catch up. Um, but, but in this case, you know, there's, I think the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Department of Transportation, they have gotten into a lot of trouble over. And there, you know, a lot of people have been very negative to them about their lack of regulation in this space. But when it comes to regulation, I'm on their side. Like the technology is still so new and nuanced is that the technology is rapidly changing. This is not the time for regulation because your regulations are going to, in theory, you know, be forever or, you know, they're very hard to change once they're in place. So you only want to regulate technology that's mature. So what's happening here is we have a very immature technology. It, it's not dampening out. You know, we're not seeing, we're not settling down yet. And we're not in the settle down phase. You know, maybe in another five to 10 years, we will be in the settle down phase. Right now, the, at least in America, the regulatory agencies don't need to start regulating. They just need to amp up their oversight, particularly when it comes to experimental technology. So they do have the ability to control experimental technology more than they do, um, you know, broad regulation. So, and, and they're doing it. So every company has to report their accidents now, if you're a self-driving car company on a regular basis. Uh, the government's releasing that data. People like me are analyzing it and showing you where we are and what, what is and is not happening. So I'm actually, you know, surprisingly, like, we're kind of okay where we are right now. I think the real crux of the regulation actually needs to come at the state level. And this is kind of a nuance that a lot of people don't understand, is that the federal government in America controls the technology. So they regulate technology at the federal level, but states give the companies permits to operate. So right now, all the real regulation is happening at the state level. And California, and in full disclosure, I'm helping them. I'm a paid consultant to the state of California. Uh, and that's recent because I think that they were feeling like they were out of their depth. They have the bulk of the self-driving companies there. They need help thinking about how to regulate that and control the permit process. Other states, it's a wild, wild west. And so not every state is as good as California. What's New York State like? They've been kind of in a wait and see mode. Uh, you know, in the city, self-driving cars are not at all popular because of the threat to taxis. And I tell taxi drivers everywhere, like, you, you don't have to worry. Uh, you know, it's, um, 
it's it's not a clear and present threat at the moment. I'm not saying it never will be, but the cars are are still really struggling. And a place of high uncertainty like New York City, you know, that kind of dynamic environments are very difficult for these cars. So I don't think New York City is going to be under threat anytime soon. Um, although, you know, there there's burbling. But I think more importantly, states have to get a good set of what I would call acceptance test. If you're going to allow self-driving cars to come into your city, you should, they should be, a, they should give you some data. What's their hard braking look like? So it turns out one of the things that's happening with self-driving cars are they slam on their brakes a lot harder and a lot faster than human driven cars. And so we see a much higher rate of rear end collisions for self-driving cars than we would for um, human driven cars. And we know- no, Isn't that strange no, by the way? No, like, it's not strange that, at no? all because if you know how computer vision works, that's what's happening is computer vision hallucinates. Remember I told you three- you, 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 Okay, so, you, so you're saying that this happens because it just doesn't see something right. until it's too late. Well, well yeah. oh, no, no, it sees something yeah. that's not there. So- uh, Oh, okay. Oh, that too, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. It sees something that's not there. Or 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 it wasn't there and suddenly it's there right. and now it's too late. That's right. right? Yeah. So, okay. you know, um, the mechanism for all of these rear end crashes is quite clear. So a state needs to gather that data and say, okay, well, you can't have, we, and we know how often this has for humans, if it happens for humans. So you say, look, your rate has to be lower than humans before you can deploy. Your um, you have to have a remote operation center, and there can be no remote driving, uh, but you do need remote monitoring, and the remote monitors do need to be able to hit the big red button to stop anything from happening if they see a situation evolving like that pedestrian accident in San Francisco. So there's a lot that that states should be doing, but for example, because you know. There's no common way to share all this data. Everything I just told you about what New York should be doing is probably brand new news to New York. I'm telling all of this to California, but New York has never heard this. And so unless New York has somebody like me on staff, they don't know that they should be gathering all this data. That's why it's kind of the wild, wild west out there. One of the other problems with the remote operations, for example, is the people who are remotely operating these cars, even monitoring the cars, they can be drunk, they can be high, they can be in another country, they don't have to be American, they, you know, they don't have to work for the company. It could be some granny looking at her phone in Spain, for example. So you know, there's just no regulation. And, and indeed, that's where the federal government does need to step in because we need blanket remote operations rules to say you have to be within a certain distance. You have to have, you can't operate at X latencies. You must have drug testing um, like we do for air traffic controllers. Like we would never agree that all of those um, conditions would be acceptable for air traffic control. So why would we agree for that in remote operations of autonomous vehicles? By the way, you know, you've mentioned data a few times. And so let, let's, let's pivot to that. Who actually owns the data? So I buy a Tesla and I'm driving around. Am I permitted to share that data with uh, anyone, like the regulators? Or does Tesla own it? Well, you know, I, you, there's a complicated contract that you sign when you buy a Tesla. And you have access to the data, but you agree that the data is housed uh, at Tesla. I think you have the ability to turn some things off, like you could turn off the in-cabin camera, uh, you know, and it, that's always a constantly evolving. So if you have a Tesla, you need to re review your contract to see what you said. So in the end, though, you do not have full control of, of your data from Tesla. Um, I know that because I do do expert witness consulting occasionally and Tesla drivers, I am currently helping a Tesla driver who did kill someone and I'm trying to keep that person from going to jail. And Tesla was so happy to turn over all the data to the prosecutor. So, you know, I'm sure that the, you know, I'm sure that driver would have preferred otherwise. Yeah, no, the reason I asked the question is because, 
look, you know, if uh, ultimately our trust in this technology depends on how it performs, what the data tells us. And yet there's like a real sort of incentive problem here with sharing data, right? And that's Absolutely. oftentimes the case is that the people who own the data don't want to share it. But 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 this is a sort of a weird situation we're in because they should want to share it to engender trust, um, you know, while protecting their IP. I mean, is this sort of one of those murky areas that regulators are trying to sort through? That is, you know, could people, for example, opt in to data sharing, you know, when they're driving their autonomous vehicles, you know? Um, yeah, I, I mean, may, they, maybe could. they could. And, and they could even get paid for it, right? I mean, I've often made the case that people should get paid for their data, you know, whether it's in healthcare or whatever, right? If this is data that's being used to improve a technology, then, you know, why not incent people to share it, you know, possibly by even paying them for it? Well, you know, the car companies in total uh, are in a lot of trouble. You know, I think it was uh, GM or Ford recently who got in trouble for selling data from their drivers that people did not know that they were selling. You know, when when people run around saying data is the new oil, then, you know, companies take that seriously and they're trying to monetize it. Tesla's, you pay a ton of money for a car and you don't own any of the data, right? So, you know, I, and to Tesla's credit, I mean, well, that's a good business model for them that people are paying them a lot of money and then they can continue to monetize that data. You know, I think I think that the, these issues really point more to the need to have savvier buyers. And I think one day, if if buyers of cars demanded that they're not going to buy a car unless they have full and total control over the data um, around their car, particularly for operations of the car. You know, I, I think that would change the, the, the way that the OEMs operate. But right now, people don't even know to ask. Yeah, fascinating, this whole uh, space of data here. So, Missy, I want to come back to uh, your uh, experiences as a fighter pilot and, and the whole sort of aircraft design of these human computer systems, right? We had those two... Uh, aircraft crashes in 2019, you know, where uh, the pilot couldn't override the computer. Uh, and and in one case, I think it was a Lion Air that went into a stall. What's been, what, what's, what's been the sort of fallout of that? Has there been new thinking about what the human computer interface should look like in aircraft? Because it seems to me that in, in aircraft, there's more time to respond than in sort of autonomous vehicles where stuff can happen in a fraction of a second. I mean, the Joshua Brown case, by the way, the ex-Marine, the, I think he was the first person to get killed in a Tesla crash. Apparently, that was a seven-second, you know, the, he had seven seconds to actually see the truck and respond, right? That's a long time to respond and didn't, you know, despite warnings. But in my sort of near-death experience, I calculated that I had about a tenth of a second to respond from the time of recognition to impact. So there's not a whole lot you can do in uh, you know, a car that's moving at 50 miles an hour and you've got 15 feet of roadway to react. But I can imagine in airplanes, it's a slightly different situation that you probably have seconds or more to react. Has there been sort of a rethinking about uh, you know, design of these systems in, uh, in airplanes? Well, like I talked about before, aviation had its real autonomy moment in the 1990s. And they learned then what the right practices were. And you know, like I said, there was a big spike of research of which I am part of that. And, uh, and so we did learn a lot about what to do and what not to do. And indeed, for the longest time, Boeing led the way. They, most everybody would agree that, you know, company-wise, Boeing had the best human factors researchers of any company. And, you know, I mean, it's not that that's still true today, but I think the 737 MAX problems really show you that you can still have all the best people on your team and you can know what the right thing is to do 
but then management can make a decision that overrides them. And indeed, that's what happened because there was a pedostatic failure. I mean, it became the single point of failure, which, you know, I mean, that was a company decision to take out the redundancy there, which is just mind boggling as an aviator that they would do that. And then, of course, mind boggling that they would not tell the pilots that the system was in there. I mean, so, so they had a lot of business decisions that went against everything that old Boeing, the old Boeing corporate culture would not have done. So, you know, this is a good example of if your management overrides good engineering judgment, then, you know, you're kind of left holding the bag and you, you will kill somebody, which is what happened. So I, I feel like aviation had to relearn. It's not that they ever lost that, but they just had to know that and recognize that sometimes the corporate culture can, can just get out of control and you have to remind them the value of human factors, et cetera. I can compare that to Tesla, for example, that there have been depositions that have been put on the internet. Like they don't consider human factors important. They never had a human factors division. They don't think that these people are legitimate engineers and they didn't, haven't ever included them at all uh, in their company culture. So like what sense does that make? I mean, oh, so <laughs> <laughs> um, I could take sort of the uh, a view, and let me let me try and justify that, like as lame as it might sound, right? So I I might say that look, all that stuff is not necessary because there's not enough time to react, right? That these are instantaneous situations, and let's just focus on getting the technology better, um, you know, because at the end of the day, that's what really matters. This whole sort of human interface design, there's not enough time for it. You know, so yeah, I'm I'm sort of playing devil's advocate here. Is is that the kind of thinking that drives the, you know, the 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 reason to not have these people around? Just let's just focus on getting the technology better. Uh, uh you know, I don't think it's defensible, no matter how way how well you turn it. Like, I, you know, it, you've got a car that is requiring a human to pay very close attention. I mean, and it's the car states over and over again, you must pay close attention. This car will do the wrong thing at the wrong time. You know, you've, you, you see that message continually hammered home. Uh, and so you're heavily reliant on the human. And then for you to say, but I don't need to think at all about the, how we should design for the human. You know, I just, I don't think it's defensible. I, 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 you know, and I think Tesla, eventually there will be a lawsuit that will go forward and, and Tesla will pay the price, um, through a jury award because, you know, it's, if it's clear, you know, you brought up Joshua Brown, Joshua Brown died. It was clear there was a huge, huge human factors problem. Then that year was 2016 in 2024, there are people still dying in accidents that almost mirror his exactly, you know, juries are not going to stand. Now, when that. you say it was a human factor problem, uh, um, I mean, so clearly it was a technology problem because the car didn't even see the truck making that turn across the highway. Was it a human factors problem because the car should, you know, because I believe it was warning him several times. And he just kept going. So was it a human practice problem in that the car should at some point have said, no, I'm just not driving anymore. I'm just going to stop. I, I don't remember the details about the exact pattern of warning. I don't think that it, you know, I think at that time, drivers on divided highways could have their hands off the steering wheel for around 45 seconds. So, and I think the car... I mean, it may have warned him many, many seconds before that, but like, you know, he, if you're in that 45 second gap and that car pulls across the road, then you're done for. So at that, and indeed, I mean, you could go back and look at the National Transportation Safety Board report that one of their recommendations from that report is that you cannot let people go this long without a warning to get their hands back on the steering wheel. Uh, but even though, you know, you can remind people constantly to put their hands on the steering wheel, but we've had, we've seen plenty of accidents where people have their hands on the steering wheels and they still kill other people. 
that they hid in their car because it's just so easy to look away for just a second. I just sure, yeah, or even to get exhausted. Right? I mean, which is why cars warn you after a while that like you've been driving for three hours. You know, take a break, get a coffee because you might actually see a car and not see it right. because you're just that's exhausted. Right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So I don't think um, I don't think that it's defensible for any company that has any technology that has any kind of interaction with humans. I don't think it's defensible for you to not have a human factors division or at a bare minimum hire consultants. Yeah, yeah. But you know, before before I let you go and um say a little bit more about like what led you to become a fighter pilot. Did you always want to be that? Uh, or did it just sort of happen somewhere along the way? Yeah, you know, I didn't know I could be a fighter pilot until I got to the Naval Academy. So when I went to the Naval Academy, I thought I was going to be an intelligence officer because women could be intelligence officers. So while I was at the Naval Academy, I found out that they could do something more than that. And then I thought, well, wow, you know, I mean, and Top Gun had just come out, right? So, you know, <laughs> who wouldn't want to be a fighter pilot yeah, was, was yeah. my way of thinking. And and what was that experience like? And and how how many years were you a fighter pilot? Um, you know, I started in I started flying in eighty eight and left in I, I stopped flying in ninety seven, so about nine years. And so, you know, it was a you know, it's too hard to encapsulate into a few minutes, but you know, it, it was an area of personal growth and it was hard and it was hard being singled out as a woman. How many fighter pilots had there been uh, prior to that women? Pilots? Oh, I was in the first group. So, wow. Yeah. Well, Missy, I have uh, thoroughly enjoyed our conversation and I actually feel like I'm just getting started because there's so many things, other things I want to talk to you about that I will follow up. Uh, separately, because I'm also very interested in this notion of you know when we trust AI and how we design uh, interfaces uh, to machines to make them more safe. But really, thanks for your time. I really enjoyed reading your work and continue to look forward to uh, seeing more of it. I mean, this is a great space to be in. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. <laughs>